Up, up, up. <laughs>
Before you put the torch to the work, you want to make sure that you have the flame adjusted properly. You don't want an oxidizing flame and you don't want a reducing flame. You want an absolutely neutral flame. So you add more oxygen until the point of the flame is sharp and there's no shadow beyond. And we're done. We've got a nice firm joint now. Tube's a little hot, but this will look real nice once we get it nickel plated. Now that it's the end of the season, we want to take a look at the part that we repaired using JB Weld at the beginning of the season. Let's lower the canopy a little bit and take a look at the part. It's this handle here on the cross brace. This handle takes a lot of stress whenever it's windy. This cross brace is what keeps the canopy from folding up in the wind. Let's take the handle inside Vintage Garage and have a look at it, see how it looks. This is the little handle off the transporter. Looks to us that there's a new crack starting right here. But the crack that we repaired with JB Weld is still holding nice and firmly. There's no sign of it separating and it's still nice and strong. So we're going to say that JB Weld really did fix the part and it held up under race conditions. We'll go outside and put it back on the canopy and declare the test a success. Well that finishes our projects for the season. We had a great time. Glad you came along. Now we're going to take you behind the scenes at Vintage Garage for a segment we call the Making of Vintage Garage. If you've ever wanted to make your own cable TV show, you'll want to stay tuned. We'll show you everything we've learned and take you behind the scenes at Vintage Garage. So let's get started. We start and finish every show behind this portable bench set we built. We framed it out of 2x4s and 1x6s and it has a plywood top. It's strong enough so that we can rebuild a motor on this bench, but we also use it for our small projects such as our test of JB Weld, our silk screening of t-shirts, and the various other projects where we need to have close-ups and detail work. We'll use the bench now for just such a shot as we discuss the video cameras that we use at Vintage Garage. The most important part of the equipment that we need to produce the show is our video camera. We had a couple of requirements when we bought our first camera. We wanted to edit the show on our PC, so we wanted a mini DV format. We started with this Panasonic model DV-101. It was the least expensive camera that we could buy. It's since been replaced by the Panasonic DV-51, which retails for under $500. It's a very good camera. On the side of the camera, there are various ports that are important. In particular with this camera, there's a firewire port. We use that to transfer the digital images to our PC for editing. Below that is an analog port. We'll get into the use of that port toward the end of the show, but for now it's sufficient to say that we use that port to dub our master VHS copies that we turn into MCT every week. The camera comes with a number of accessories. In particular, it comes with this battery charger and AC powered battery eliminator. Plug the AC cord into the wall, and if you remove this cord, it becomes a battery charger. The camera also comes with one of these small batteries that will last about a half hour. Alternatively, you can just plug the end of this cable into the camera and you can run the camera on AC power. The advantage to that is that you don't have to continually change batteries. The disadvantage is, is that you're tripping over the cord all the time while you're dragging it around the shop. We started filming our shows using the AC adapter, but very quickly it became too much of a nuisance so we just switched to battery power. We bought an accessory battery that's twice as thick as the battery that you get with the camera and lasts about twice as long. We can film for an hour with this battery under normal conditions. 
This camera also has stereo microphones. There's a left microphone and a right microphone and that brings up the only deficiency that we found with this camera. There's no provision for a remote microphone. We didn't realize the significance of that when we bought the camera and it was a big mistake. We also started filming the show with an inexpensive tripod that we bought. It's perfectly adequate for most jobs. As long as it's not windy, it provides a stable platform to the camera. Unfortunately, an inexpensive tripod has one big disadvantage. They're generally short. Fully extended, this tripod is about four and a half feet tall. So for the first few shows, we had to set the tripod on boxes to raise it up to our eye level. That became a real nuisance. One of the smartest things we did was purchase this optional accessory from Panasonic. This is the remote control unit and it costs around $30. Among other things, it allows us to zoom in on a shot or zoom out on a shot remotely. We can also turn the camera off and back on again using the remote control. It's a real handy device and allows us to take most of our shots without a cameraman. This is the Panasonic model DV401 camera. It costs around $200 more than the Panasonic DV101 camera. It has a number of extra features. However, there's only one of the extra features that we use. This camera has a provision for a remote microphone, and that's crucial to the filming of the show. Right now we're filming this video using the built-in microphones on the Panasonic DV101 camera. They're adequate when the voice of the person speaking is close to the camera, as it is now. The sound quality between the two cameras is identical when you're using the built-in microphones on either. However, when the camera is moved back from the scene, a remote microphone is absolutely essential, and we'll show you that in just a minute. We also bought one other accessory. This is a mono to stereo adapter jack that we bought from Radio Shack for a couple of dollars. Typically, the end of a microphone cord has a mono jack on it. It plugs into the camera fine, but the camera will only record the left channel of the stereo signal. Before we had this adapter, we had to fix that problem in the final editing on the PC. We did that by duplicating the left channel and writing it out onto the right channel in the editing process. That made both channels the same and rather than hearing sound out of the left speaker you heard identical sound out of both the left and the right speaker. By using this little adapter we saved that editing step which was time consuming. We just push that into the camera, plug our microphone into the camera, and now whatever we record through the microphone is automatically put on both the left and right stereo channels. This is the second tripod that we bought. It ran around $60. Our initial tripod was $20. And the key advantage to this one is that it's taller. There's also a hook on the bottom where we can keep our earphones. And it provides a steadier platform than the inexpensive one. The head of the tripod also allows for smoother panning than the less expensive one. However, we almost never pan our shots, and so that isn't too important. In effect, for $40 extra, what we got was a tripod that would allow us to move the camera up to the height of our face. Now let's put everything together and give you a chance to see what we see when we're filming the TV show. We have the DV-101 camera running behind us, and we have the DV-401 camera on the tripod pointed at our face. We've turned off our key light because the camera behind us would be pointing directly at the light and wouldn't be able to see the teleprompter. This is where we stand when we film the beginning and ending of the sequence. And this also shows our crude teleprompter. Normally we don't make up notes and use the teleprompter because we find it difficult to keep our eyes from moving while we read it. And it's obvious to the viewer that we're reading our text. So we try to memorize the text before we go and then not use it. But once in a while if there's a long sequence that we need We'll type it up on a sheet of paper and put it below the camera and just read it. We've turned our key light back on now. Now let's talk a little bit about sound. 
As we mentioned earlier, we found it's absolutely critical to have a camera that has a remote microphone jack on it. And here's why. Right now we're talking on the lavalier mic connected to the remote microphone jack on the camera. And the sound quality is pretty good. We tested perhaps a dozen microphones before we found this lavalier microphone that had good sound quality. Let's disconnect the lavalier microphone from the camera and continue talking. This is what it sounds like using the two built-in microphones on the camera. It's not bad. The camera is about five feet from my face. However, when I move the camera back for a distant shot, you'll hear a dramatic difference. We're at a distance now and we're using the built-in microphones on the camera. As you can see, there's a lot of echo. It's difficult to hear. It's not too bad, but it's not good enough. Now let's hook in the lavalier mic, keep the camera at the same distance. Now we're back on the lavalier mic and you can hear the difference. Regardless of the distance the camera is from the subject, the sound quality is always consistent and uniform. There is one downside, however. We haven't found any remote lavalier mics that work well in the shop. The shop has perhaps 20 fluorescent lights in the ceiling and it has electrical wiring all around the walls. We find it very difficult to get good sound quality without picking up a hum from the AC wiring in the shop. So we're still experimenting trying to find a good remote lavalier mic setup. That means as we move the camera from project to project, we have to be careful not to trip over the cord between the lavalier mic and the camera. It's quite a nuisance. We're now talking on a lavalier mic so you can hear what I'm saying, but I want to show you our best sound technique for filming sequences at the bench. We have a Sony microphone that we've hung from the ceiling. We plug this end of the microphone into the camera and the cord runs up to the ceiling through a couple of screw eyes and down to the mic which hangs right over the bench. We frame the shot so the microphone is just off camera so that you can't see it. Let's move the camera over in front of the bench and connect this microphone and see what the sound quality is like. Now we're talking through the mic that's hanging from the ceiling. This is our favorite setup for filming our bench sequences especially our opening and closing sequences. We don't have to wear the lavalier mic, we don't have to trip over the cords, we can walk around the shop and whenever we come back to the bench the sound quality is pretty good. The microphone is hanging right here, I'll pull it down a little bit so you can see it. So I just put it just outside of the range of the camera and it just dangles up there just out of sight and the sound quality is pretty good. This setup now is exactly the same. We're using the overhead mic to talk, but we have the AC adapter plugged into the camera instead of the little battery. You can hear the AC hum that's picked up in the signal, and that's just not acceptable. The AC adapter works fine if you're using the built-in microphones in the camera, but we found that if you use a remote microphone, the long cord to the microphone acts like an antenna and picks up the AC noise from the shop wiring. Now let's talk about our lighting setup at Vintage Garage. We think we have a pretty good setup and we sure didn't spend much money on it. When we started we were faced with the prospect of buying professional lights and they could run several thousand dollars. We think we did a good job and we spent less than a hundred. So here's what we did. When we first started filming the show we didn't use any lights. The inexpensive digital video cameras are amazingly good at adjusting for light. In addition, you don't need to adjust the focus, the white balance, or any of the other properties of the video image. They do a great job on their own. Here's what this shot looks like with no additional lighting. This is what the shot looks like just using the existing lighting in the shop. It's not too bad. There's a fluorescent light behind me and above, and a number of fluorescent lights around the shop. The shop is actually pretty dark right now, but the camera adjusts the light quite well. It also does a good job on the white balance and the focus. The first thing that we did was we built three light stands. We just built them out of electrical conduit, and we'll go over the construction of those right now. It allows us to position our light anywhere up the stand. 
Let's go over to the bench and have a look at that in some detail. In essence, this shows the construction of one of our light stands. We built three light stands so that we could do classic three-point lighting. We use one stand for our key light, one stand for our fill light, and one stand for our backlight. We also added a second light to our backlight stand, and sometimes we use that stand to light up the background in a shot. Rather than point it at the back of the subject, we point it at the background of the scene. We use these halogen shop lights. You can get these at Home Depot or Lowe's, and they're only $10 a piece. We've mounted them to the stand just using hose clamps. We TIG welded on a bracket here on either side of the light, and that's for storage of the cord. You can wind the cord up at the end of the chute and just have everything stay on the stand nice and neat. The light can also swivel so you can point it up or down and direct it at the action. On this stand near the top, we also have mounted a second one. This is the light that we use typically when we're using this stand as a backlight. The base of the stand is also real simple. Each stand is about seven and a half feet long. We TIG welded the leftover pieces and made a tripod. There's no need for the tripod to be able to disassemble, and there's no need for the stand to telescope since these stands never leave our shop. That allowed us to keep the construction pretty simple. The entire cost of each light stand, including the extension cord, the halogen light, the conduit that built the stand, the clamps, and everything else is under $16 a stand. We also modified one of our light stands with the addition of this piece of scrap aluminum tube. We just fixed it to the light with another hose clamp, but that allows us to put our photographic umbrella in front of this light. We use the umbrella to soften the light from the shot. We often use the umbrella when we use this stand as our fill light. The umbrella also comes with this black cover and we can put that on the umbrella. With the cover on the umbrella, it now becomes a reflecting umbrella. Now let's show you how the stands are used. This is the lighting setup that we normally use when we film the opening and closing segments of the show. We have our key light on the right with a bright halogen light near the ceiling pointed at our face. On the left, we have our fill light We've softened it using the reflective umbrella. It's also near the ceiling. Behind the bright light on the left is our backlight. Once we finish filming the show, we bring our tapes into this back room at Vintage Garage where we have a Sony digital studio set up. The rolling motion that you see on the computer monitor really isn't there. It only shows up when we take a video of the computer screen. A Sony Digital Studio is a PC that Sony's configured with a FireWire port right on the front of the motherboard, a 60 gig hard drive, a Pentium 4 processor, and a clock speed of 1.5 gigahertz. It's a powerful machine and now they're relatively inexpensive. We do all our editing on this PC and here's how we do it. The digital camera has a FireWire port right here. And when we connect the FireWire to the camera, our camera in effect becomes our tape drive. We put in our tapes one by one and transfer our images from the camera to the hard drive of the PC. Then it's a simple matter using point and click to edit the show. After we've edited our show using the Adobe Premiere software, there's a window that lets us preview the show. After we have the show edited exactly as we'd like it, we put a blank mini DV tape back into the camera and now we dump the show from the PC's hard drive back into the camera over the fire wire. We're now over in our little reception area at Vintage Garage where we have a TV and VCR combination. This is where we make our master VHS copy of the tape that we turn into MCT every week. We brought our camera over from the PC and inside we have the digital master DV tape that we made. 
we leave it in the camera and rewind it. And then we plug the connection to the VHS tape deck into the analog port on the side of the camera. And we can just set it up there so that we can view the show. We put in a blank VHS tape. And once the tape is rolling, we turn on the camera. Once we've finished recording the master VHS copy, we eject it from the tape drive. Then we put a nice label on it that we made on our PC. And we're done. Now you want to get out that pen and paper we told you about early in the show because we're about ready to give you an important phone number. Einstein and I are now going to get in the MGA twin cam and drive over to Montgomery Community TV and turn in our tape for the week. Montgomery Community TV offers a number of inexpensive classes to county residents. They include the field producer class, the field technician class, and studio producer and technician classes. For more information about training at Montgomery Community TV, give them a call at 301-424-1730. If you don't live in Montgomery County, most likely your local cable provider has a similar program of training. That's it for this week at Vintage Garage, and it's also that's it for this season at Vintage Garage. Glad you were here. We had a great time. Next season on Vintage Garage, we'll be restoring the Titan Mark IX Formula Ford. We'll start by painting the chassis, and then week by week we'll assemble the car, restoring the parts as we go. In addition, we'll have plenty of field trips to the vintage races, and lots of racing action. So until next season, Thanks for coming. Glad you were here. Keep the shiny side up. We'll see you next season. If you'd like more information about any of the projects we've worked on today, please visit our website at www.vintagegarage.com. There's a link to our email address on the website. Please email us. We'd like to hear from you. Till next time, keep the shiny side up. Thanks for coming. See you next week.